The Lord be with you. It is indeed uh, exciting to see you all this morning, and especially want to welcome uh, those who are here for the first time. Uh, your presence here honors us. So exciting to have you this morning. As you may have noticed, um, we have a number of our staff uh, not here with us. Uh, Bill, uh, Larry and Beth are in their family funeral, so they are at uh, Lexington uh, right now. And Terry is at vacation. And Bill, uh, the carpet exchange that uh, he is preaching at Beulah uh, this morning. Uh, I asked Bill, because Tim is asking me, can we handle this? And I asked Bill, is there anybody in the hospital uh, still, I, I did no answer. So I guess uh, there is no one in the hospital uh, this morning that anybody know of. And I suppose Holy Spirit can help us to carry through uh, in spite of number of staff who are not here. Yes. Bob? Okay, come there, closer. There's one person in the hospital that I'm aware of. Her uh -huh. name is Ruth Rassanier. Okay. And she's in the hospital at the moment. We'll remember Ruth uh, as we uh, enter into our worship. Uh, we'd like to introduce, well, uh, a couple of announcement, announcements. Korean Church today, that they are having a 40th anniversary. Uh, so they are celebrating uh, with a big lunch and everything. And you are most welcome and invited if you like to uh, be part of the celebration. And uh, we'll have the uh, annual congregational meeting next Sunday following the worship service. Um, I, I'd like to introduce two people. First, Mary uh, Nevelsick, uh, who is going to please stand. We welcome you. And she will share the a minute for mission later on. And uh, her uh, short bio is, is in the bulletin on the yellow sheet there. And Reverend Joel Weibel, uh, pronounced like a Bible, uh, Weibel, what a good name. And we welcome you from Pee Wee Valley Presbyterian Church for that purple, ex purple exchange this morning. I look forward to hear you preaching this morning. Thank you. All right. Uh, this is a time to pass the, the friendship path, uh, especially uh, for those who are here for the first time, and tell us about who you are, and we'll be happy to know you. Gather our hearts and enter into the presence of our Lord. Let us worship.
It is good to be gathered in the house of the Lord, a different house for me this morning, the same Lord for us all always. If you're comfortably able, will you please stand with me and let us join together in our call to this worship hour. Happy are those whose footsteps follow the way of the Lord. Happy are those whose hearts delight in the law of the Lord. Happy are our souls when we gather to worship the living God.
the grace of God overflows for us through Christ Jesus who came into the world to save sinners. Trusting in God's grace, let us confess our sin together in one voice. God of steadfast love, how often do we utter careless words that humiliate or harm? How often do we lash out in anger that we could reach out in the kindness? How often do we hurt those we love and tear away at relationships that give life? Forgive us, we pray. In your abundant mercy, give us the grace to confess our faults, to seek forgiveness, and to work for reconciliation in our homes and our communities. Turn our hearts back to you and teach us the ways of love so that we might hold fast to one another and draw near to your presence. mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. I declare to you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. And all God's people say, Amen. Amen. As God's forgiven people, may the peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. O oh God, tell us what we need to hear and show us what we ought to do to obey Jesus Christ. Amen. 
The scripture this morning is from Deuteronomy 30, 15 through 20. See, I have set before you today life and prosperity, death and adversity, if you obey the commandments of the Lord your God that I am commanding you today by loving the Lord your God, walking in his ways, and observing his commandments, decrees, and ordinances, then you shall live and become numerous, and the Lord your God will bless you in the land that you are entering to possess. But if your heart turns away and you do not hear, but are led astray to bow down to other gods and serve them, I declare to you today that you shall perish. You shall not live long in the land that you are crossing the Jordan to enter and possess. I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, blessings and curse. Choose life so that you and your descendants may live, loving the Lord your God, obeying him, and holding fast to him. For that means life to you and length of days, so that you may live in the land that the Lord swore to give to you, your ancestors, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. Thus saith the Lord. If I could have all the children come up, and I have some special helpers with us today. <coughs> If you could come up to you. I hope everybody's okay. You can sit up here if you want, it's fine. I won't make you guys sit on the floor. Come on up, everybody. I'm gonna stand today because I'm gonna come over here with our friends too. So, everybody up here? Ooh, come on up. I'm so excited. Who has had a great week this week at school? You guys can sit. It's okay, you guys can sit. You've had a good week at school today, this week? Okay. Have you guys had a good week? Yes. Was anybody excited that there was um, like really cold temperatures? Because we didn't really have any snow to go along with the cold temperatures, right? Ugh, what a bummer. And then it's supposed to be really warm, so. Um, does anybody know another language? Do any of you kids know another language? Yeah, you know another language? Does any of you all know another language? Ooh, we got a bunch out there. So today, I'm going to have some of my friends say a greeting in another language. We're going to start with Paul. Put a mic on. Yeah. 안녕하십니까. 오늘 예배에 참석하여 주셔서 너무 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 기쁩니다. Bienvenue à l'église Augustin. Guten Morgen. Ich bin freulich, dass Sie sind hier in Kirche. Hola, como estas? So, did anybody understand any of that that we just said? No, yes, some people did. Yes, okay, awesome. Hopefully they did a good job and what they said was good because I didn't understand it, all right? Um, but what I did understand is the way that they spoke with kind of a happy part of their voice and their face was um, engaging. And so even though I didn't understand the words, I understood what they meant, right? In our bulletin today, there's actually, we sang in Latin, so that's another language you guys know, even though I only know a little bit. And then if you look down the next song, The Glory to God, it's written in Spanish underneath of the English. And then in our Bible, so this is going to be part of what you can do during church. In the Bible, do you see down here at the bottom? See right there? So sometimes at the bottom of the... Um, the hymns that we sing, there's other languages written. And this one is Amazing Grace, and it happens to have some Native American underneath of it. So when you're sitting in your seats and you have nothing else to do but bother your parents, um, I mean, I'm sorry, when you have nothing else to do but drink in the spirit in the service, you can look for that. But if we don't always know what people are saying, how can we understand them? What's like a universal language? Do you guys know a universal language? No? I'm, okay, Jesus is a good answer, but it doesn't count this time. So I'm glad you didn't say it, because that's always the default answer, right? So music, right? Music is a universal language. Did you guys know that? Yeah, yeah, okay. So even if 
I don't understand what somebody's singing. I can understand the spirit of it. I can understand the meaning of it. In the handbells today, we're going to play um, a song that is a Jewish song from the Jewish faith. And it talks about peace, and there are several different um, songs together in a melody, and it talks about peace. And so what we look at is the fact that music can bring everybody together. So even if you sing a song in Spanish, and you sing a song in Japanese, and you sing a song in German, we all know that that brings us together, because music brings everybody together, no matter what's going on. Okay? So when you guys leave, I want you to think about bringing music to other people, even if you don't know them. All right? Go ahead and put your hands together and bow your heads and repeat after me. Dear Lord, please help us to share with other people the music of our hearts and of our Lord Jesus. Amen. Cynthia, thank you, and boys and girls, thank you. Cynthia came up just before uh, service started this morning and asked me if I happened to speak, being the learned scholar Presbyterian minister that I am, uh, Greek or Hebrew. Alas, I do not, uh, such as the education of a Presbyterian minister, a J-term class in both Hebrew and Greek. Uh, but what a wonderful message, Cynthia. Thank you. And good morning once again, everyone. What a thrill it is for me to be here this morning. This is a, a first for me. I've not been able to participate in the neighbor-to-neighbor -neighbor pulpit exchange that's been going on for four or five, only four years uh, now with uh, John Odom has put this together. It's uh, always been on the fourth Sunday of February, which is also the annual meeting at Peewee Valley Presbyterian, just as yours is next week, at least this year. So I've not been able to participate, but when it was on the third Sunday this year, I did sign up. Uh, great, great thrill for me to be here. Very, very cool. I do bring you greetings from the entire community at Pee Wee Valley Presbyterian Church. They are worshiping at this same hour, 1030. Uh, over there, Reverend Cynthia Campbell from Highland Presbyterian is in the pulpit at Pee Wee Valley. I bring you greetings from my wife as well, who very much wanted to be here. We were in Bowling Green, Kentucky, where her parents live, uh, and she needed, uh, felt the need to stay with her ailing mother this morning. We'll be back later today for the school week. I'm sorry that she's not here, and she is as well. You have a little bit of information about me in your bulletin and about Pee Wee Valley Presbyterian Church. I hope you have a chance to look at that at some point this morning, hopefully not during my sermon, but. Perhaps that's partly up to me. I, uh, I actually was ordained in this presbytery 20 years ago, associate pastor at Highland Presbyterian, served there about nine years, and I've been at Pee Wee Valley now in my 12th year. Uh, so I have a relationship with many of you individually and see a lot of friendly uh, faces, well, very familiar faces, and most of them friendly. Um, <laughs> But also have had the chance to serve with many of you on um, presbytery committees and units and boards and, uh, yes, camp boards. Uh, and be at Triennium. I uh, was at Triennium this summer with uh, Jonathan and Paul and Henry, youth of this congregation. Are they here this morning? I'm going to call them out. All right, Jonathan, good deal. Good to have you here. So I may feel a little more at home than some of our other pastors in different congregations uh, on this Sunday. And that's part of the reason that I, I felt bold to allow and even encourage what my sermon title suggests this morning, some abnormal behavior from all of you. I'm going to recommend this type of behavior, in fact, in your daily life going forward first. Let's pray together. Gracious God, we do pause to pray that in these moments, the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts may be acceptable in your sight, you who are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Now, friends, before reading the scripture text, I want to let you know that I am not a lectionary preacher. 
I don't often follow the assigned scripture uh, for the Sundays, choosing rather to preach more topically or seasonally. I was talking a little bit with Bill and Samantha in the office and looking at a few of the last bulletins of yours. It doesn't seem like Bill is a strict lectionary preacher either, though you have been reading and hearing from the Gospel of Matthew in some weeks past. That's good because, curiously enough, this morning I am choosing to follow the lectionary with this morning's scripture and this message. I'm moving ahead a bit in Matthew 5, a little beyond the verses actually suggested for the lectionary reading, but we're reading and hearing once again from the Gospel of Matthew. Before I do that and before I offer my sermon message, I feel the need to introduce myself a little bit, theologically speaking, very briefly, to prepare you a bit for what you will be hearing. The experience of Jesus of Nazareth as Messiah, or in Greek, Christ, in the first century, was a very different experience than most Jewish men and women were expecting. You know this. Jesus of Nazareth was not the anticipated Davidic warrior king in first century Jewish end times hope that was supposed to come and wipe away the violence and tyranny in the world with his own sword. As God's Messiah, Jesus' program consisted rather of healing the sick, eating with those whom he healed, pronouncing the kingdom of God not near but here in the compassionate community that he created, and doing all of this non-violently. No swords, no fire or winnowing forks, no burning or killing. Peace, he taught, will never come through violence at the tip of a sword or an AK-47 or a drone attack or a nuclear missile. Peace on earth as it is in heaven can and will only come nonviolently through justice for all. Jesus as Messiah was a paradigm shift in Jewish messianic thinking in the first century. You know all that. Now consider this. Jesus didn't advocate nonviolence because that was a a really, really good way to bug the heck out of the Romans. And Jesus didn't engage such a ministry, such a life, because he thought it was the safest way to live, given that the Romans and their flatterers had already killed so many more provocative rebels, including John the Baptist in his own time. We know from the end of his own life that playing it safe wasn't the reason Jesus was nonviolent. No, Jesus taught nonviolent resistance and lived nonviolently in order to be like God. God, Jesus taught, was, is, and always will be a nonviolent, non vindictive, non punitive. God. We should live the way we live then in order to be like God. Again, that was a paradigm shift in first century Jewish thought, and it continues to be a fairly radical shift in the way so many of us want God to act in the 21st century. We often want, even need, God to be vindictive, to punish. We often know exactly who we think God should start punishing. But that's not going to happen, not from God. God will not act that way because God is not that way. And if you don't believe me, listen to your Lord. This morning, we're engaging one of the most problematic texts for us in Jesus' teaching. Listen closely for the word of God from the fifth chapter of Matthew, verses 43 through 48. 
Jesus continues saying, you have heard it that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be children of your Father in heaven. For God makes the sun to rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the righteous and on the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers and sisters, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So Jesus has been making alterations in traditional interpretations of the Jewish law since the Sermon on the Mount began back at the beginning of this chapter in Matthew. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are the meek and the hungry. Really? The meek? Blessed are the merciful and the peacemakers. Mercy and peace in this empire. And if that wasn't abnormal enough, after telling us that we are salt and light, he begins the alterations in earnest. Among the other new directions, we're told that we are not to lose our tempers, that we must renounce the right to retaliate, these lessons are hard enough, but then just as we heard, we are instructed that we must love those who hate and harm us. That's, that's not normal. And my guess is that whenever you hear these verses, and I know you've heard them often, these verses are ones like them. You begin to spin these lessons, these instructions to us in ways that water them down or that allow for exceptions. All of this done very nobly, I'm sure, which is to say realistically for our real world. Otherwise, we'd fall into despair, right? In fact, that seems to be what these verses are intended to do, to drive us into despair, to prove to us that we are incapable of satisfying our call, of satisfying God's call and God's requirements for justice and righteousness. These verses seem to be meant to remind us that we are worms, only human after all, and incapable of such things as perfection and perfect love. So if you're like me, you find yourselves very fairly quickly making excuses and stepping back from these alterations of Jesus. Good for him, but we're not him. Well, friends, just as we begin to feel strangely comforted by our helplessness, and by our weakness, just as we begin to find all of the excuses we need for continuing to hate our enemies and continuing to curse those who persecute us in spite of what we just read and heard, we remember who is speaking. It's not Joel or Paul or Bill or Terry. It's Jesus himself. And these aren't suggestions we're given to try out. These are commandments we're given to live out. We were created in the image of God, and our excuses have no legs to stand on. In fact, our whole self-assessment has been wrong for at least 1,600 years and counting. We are not incapable of God's calling. We are not helpless to do what Jesus asks us to do. Just because we keep coming up short whenever we try is no reason to stop trying. We ask for forgiveness from God and from one another, and we try again to love 
as Jesus loved, to live as Jesus lived, to follow his way. That's why we're called Christians. The way that Jesus saves us is he shows us how to love. And then he asks us to do it. God won't do it for us. So Jesus teaches us what true love entails. He shows us himself how it's done, and he tells us, now go and do likewise. What's both paralyzing and exhilarating for us in realizing all of this is coming to the realization that these verses and all verses like them in our Gospels and beyond are not intended to drive us to despair. They are intended to save us individually and as a community and as a human race. They show us again the love that was ours to share in the beginning and is ours to share even now, especially now. I know we're comforted, very comforted by thinking that all, all that is required of us is the profession of faith that God's kingdom will come on earth. But our faith, our radical trust in and fidelity to God in the way of Jesus has a second part, proclaiming to the world that the new era of God's relations to humans has already arrived and there's work to be done. If we dare to profess faith in the new life that Jesus offers us every moment of every day, we can no longer sit passively by and wait for God to get busy. God is busy. God is waiting for us to get busy. Jesus' Sermon on the Mount and all of the alterations of all we have heard said before is not some sort of self-help program for us as individuals or as the church to try out and do the best we can. It's a vision of the world and of ourselves as it and we were created to be. It's a vision for the world and ourselves if we are to continue to be. And it's not normal, not in the world that we have created. It's not normal to love like Jesus loved. It's not normal to be meek and merciful and peaceful. So our response, if we are to be saved and be agents of salvation, must be abnormal. To negative attitudes and acts, we must make positive responses. The biggest challenge that I or any preacher faces in, is the, the so what of every message that we offer. After all is said, so what? Tell me what I'm supposed to do with that scripture, with that sermon in my life or my world. What's good news for me this morning is you don't need me or any other preacher to tell you anything more this week. Jesus himself couldn't be more clear. Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute. So a few of you may be asking, tell me then who my enemies are and who are those who are persecuting me? I won't do that because I can't tell you who those individuals or those groups are, but I'll help you help yourselves. Where are you harboring ill will toward anyone in your life at this moment? Close your eyes if it helps anyone near to you or far away. Why and what would you like to do to them? Go on, acknowledge it, admit it to yourself before God in your faith community all around. Who, why, and what? 
Now, what might these feelings about your enemies teach you about the dark corners of your own heart? How might feeling differently, how might loving those you wish ill will to or wish to harm rid you of those sides of yourselves you can't bear? Because that's where it all starts, not with them, with us. And as abnormal as it may be, our behavior must be fitting to our identity as children of God and disciples of Jesus. His teachings express the kingdom of God on earth. They are God's way of dealing with all of us, with all of humanity, love and prayer, revealed most fully in the life and death of humans like you and me. And again, you're right, it doesn't make any earthly sense. After all is said and done, after all my words and the millions that will follow after, these teachings are not to be made reasonable, for they do violate the common sense of this world. They point to another reality. They ask whether we are oriented toward retaliation and violence, toward death and hatred, or toward the mystery, the God of life and love. So go out this week and act abnormally. Tell them that Pastor Joel told you to love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. You have heard it said, now go and do likewise. Amen. In body and mind and spirit, if you are able and willing, would you stand and join me let us confess the faith of our baptism. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Please be seated. Let us pray. O oh God, you spoke your word and revealed your good news in Jesus the Christ. Fill all creation with that word again so that by proclaiming your joyful promises to all nations and singing of your glorious hope to all peoples, we may become one living body, your incarnate presence on this earth. In this presidential weekend, we thank you for the wonderful examples and the leadership and the history that they have set on us in the midst of the challenges our national leaders have taught us. We also pray that our current leaders in the government would live up to that expectation with the wisdom and the courage and also God's discerning heart. 
we praise and join in the thanksgiving of pulpit exchange of our Mid-Kentucky Presbytery. At this time, we've acknowledged that Harvey Brown is not complete as the body of Christ. We strive to be the body of Christ as we join other churches that are working together in the common purpose of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, we pray for Peewee Valley Church, Beulah, and the Korean Louisville having 40th anniversary. We join their celebration and we join the prayer concerns that the, each church has. Help us to love our enemies. We are not in competition, but we are asked to pray for those who persecute us. To God, who welcomes all in love, we pray for the good of the church and the concerns of those in need. God of every land and nation, you have created all people and you dwell among us in Jesus Christ. Listen to the cries of those who pray to you and grant that we proclaim the greatness of your name. All people will know the power of love at work in the world. Bring healing to all wounds and those who are sick, especially Ruth, who is in the hospital at this time. Make whole all that is broken. Speak truth to all illusion and shed light in every darkness that all creation will see your glory and know you are Christ. We ask this through the name of our Lord Jesus and our Lord. Amen. And we continue the prayer you taught us how to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now we invite Mary Nevelsick, Minute for Mission. She comes with a very diverse background, international background here. And I'm just looking forward to hear you at this time. Uh, thank you all for inviting me this morning. I have a very curious title, which is called Mission Specialist for Mission Interpretation. And the question is always asked, well, what do you actually do? So I sit in a beautiful office among well-meaning and accomplished people, and I listen and read as the world comes to me. Because what I do is that I sit and read all of the letters of all of the wonderful mission co-workers who the Presbyterian Church supports. So if you want to read them, you can get out your phones and type pcusa.org and you can type Mission Coworkers and you will come to a beautiful page and on this page you will see the names of all of the Mission Coworkers of the Presbyterian Church. Now these people are engaged and they are wonderful and it is humbling, deeply humbling to work with them. Because as Joel spoke about in his sermon, it is we who are asked to come to the world. We are asked to feed the world. 
We are asked to come and to heal the world. We are asked to be Christ to the world and with your support, all of the mission co-workers do exactly this. Whether it is the Boyds or the Stressleys or the Holmes that you at Harvey Brown support with your gifts directly, or if it is the Ellingtons who bring faith to a world that is hurting. You see, it is you who bring the world to my office. You can come and see me or you can see the world on your cell phones or tablets. You can hear about them, but it is you who bring the world. It is you who engage lovingly and caringly. It is you who feed the hungry, who bring faith to those who are in darkness, who comfort the poor, who visit the sick, who do everything that Matthew 25 asks you to do. And so I ask you with all of your hearts and with all of your gifts to continue to support this world because we are a world of love we live love, we feel love, and we are love. And so please continue to reach out and to be generous in this offering. Be us, be love, be compassion. Thank you. Please do remember Thank you, Mary. And the special offering this week will benefit Presbyterian uh, Word Mission. Uh, as, as we uh, return God, our offerings uh, this morning, I, I want to uh, invite you to do something little different uh, because it is a joy to stand here uh, rather than uh, standing uh, with the uh, handbell on the, the other side of the table. And, and just exciting to hear them uh, as an ensemble. How about giving a round of applause for them and helping us to worship this morning? Uh, there you go, bells. I, I do want to make a note that the fact that I'm standing here means that they have a near perfect attendance. I'm not drafted as a substitute. So that's another thing that I praise for them. There is come to offer our lives.
Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Loving God, we give thanks for for all you have given to us. And praise you for your Receive receive now this dedication. Bless our offering of the work of your kingdom. Okay, my brothers and sisters of Harvey Brown Presbyterian, the time has come to continue if you have already been, or to begin to behave and act abnormally. If, by that, you go from this place into the world and live fully, love wastefully, have the courage to be all that you were created by God to be. For as we do, God continues to bless and keep us. God's face continues to shine upon us and God continues to lift us up and give us peace now and forever. Amen.